the left center. It's going to get down for a hit. Motoring to third is Morales. The throw will be cut off. Runners at the corners and one out for Puerto Rico. Yair Fonseca with his fourth hit of the tournament. And Puerto Rico has California on its heels early. Yeah, Brent Sagan, that's just a bullet in the left center field gap. I thought that one was going to get to the fence. Credit Garcia for cutting it off. But again, the gas pedal is down with this crew from Puerto Rico. Fonseca gets to second, second, and third one out. Folks, we'll give it another minute. Shortstop. Let people come in. Might be coming in a little late. Another run scores as Morales comes home to make it two to pounds. He's two for five in the tournament ground ball and it's through the hole past the diving stags at third runner holds fonseca thought about coming home slams on the brakes rivera goes all the way to second on the play if they can get out of it without any more runs alma dovar swings at the first pitch out of the seventh spot in the lineup and he's the third out of the first but some damage done for wyama the first and now Fonseca trying to find it, and he can't hone in. Well, and they, they brought him in against Chinese Taipei, and he had an issue not finding this quality teams they had to play to get here, coming from the West. Brown ball to short, Martinez to Rodriguez for one! Did he keep his foot on the bag? You bet. Adiel Rivera with the stretch at first, and they get the 6-4-3 double play. But nice job there by Rivera using his link. Okay, welcome folks to our District 4 Baseball Rules Clinic, uh, which will cover teenage uh, baseball rules today and especially interleague rules. Uh, your ADA for teenage baseball is Grayson Lawrence, and this is his contact information. Uh, and Gra uh, Grayson, do you have an, uh, anything to say? Yeah, just a couple things. Uh, I met most of you guys at the scheduling meeting a couple weeks ago. Um, two things. One, the um, the contact list for both 50, 70, and juniors, those have been finalized and are complete. Um, I do you have the links and the emails that go to the Google or the OneDrive docs, but also the final PDFs are out on the D4 website. And I'll put that into the chat in a second. And then secondly, on, on schedules, most of the schedules are, quote, finalized. There's still con little changes coming in here and there. Continue to pass those to me as you guys adjust them, maybe based off availability of a field, or you have to move something. Just pass them to me. I'll update the master schedule. And, the, and um, again, I will put PDF files of those on the D4 website in case we have people outside of D4 that want to see the schedules. That's it, Jim. OK, thanks, Grayson. Uh, the other person we have here tonight is uh, going to be the host, and that is Don Waddell, who's the uh, UIC for District 4. I'm Jim Rose. I'm the ADA for training for California District 4. So our clinic tonight is for coaches, managers, and umpires. Uh, the focus is going to be rules specific to intermediate, junior, and senior baseball. If you've been following us, we've been uh, putting up uh, basic rules clinics, uh, which are made mostly at minors and majors. Uh, we have another one coming this Thursday, and you can register for that on the District 4 Baseball website. We'll be talking about uh, obstruction and interference. Uh, what we're going to be doing here tonight is covering also interleague rules and points of emphasis for our District 4 uh, interleague program. We'll cover the new 2022 rules. There aren't that many of them. And we'll be answering any questions that you have. So there will be a couple of slides within this presentation, and they'll be marked with questions. And if you have any questions, and don't you don't have to wait for those uh, for those slides, uh, please put them in the chat chat function and address them to Don Waddell only, and then he will ask those of me when we get to those points. We request that you please keep your computers muted. If at the very end of this presentation and we're all done, uh, I'm more than happy to speak live to. Uh, anybody who uh, wants to, and I'm sure uh, probably Grayson and Don also. Okay, 
So interleague playing rules. So the games that we're going to be playing with the interleague rules uh, are going to be a combination of the official little league rules, uh, which are in the 2022 little league baseball rules and regulations where there are local options and every league decides on local options. Uh, are you going to have a continuous batting order? Or are you going to bat nine? Or are you going to use the 10 and 15 run rule or not use them? All those are local options. And in the interleague rules, those options have been decided and they are posted. So there are no local rules that will apply. There will be no manager agreements in the interleague. In other words, two managers show up at the game site and decide to play under different rules. So those interleague rules, the blank pitching log that you'll all need and the intermediate junior uh, and schedules are all found on the baseball page for District 4. Just go to the District 4 website click on baseball and you will find all of that. There is one other kind of rule that we need to sort of talk about for a second here, and those are ground rules. And those are the rules that govern a particular field of play. Ground rules must be decided on by the leagues prior to the games being played on those fields. And the ground rules should be published on each league's website. And so examples of ground rules are uh, a, where dead ball area is located. Uh, what if a fly ball uh, hits an overhanging tree or a flag over the field of play? Those are the ground rules. Okay, let's start with our first new rule for 2022. This part of the rule isn't new, but we'll see on the next slide what is new. So Little League has mandatory play, and this is for every level of Little League, every division, baseball, softball. If a player shows up, rostered player shows up, they must have a minimum of one at bat and a minimum of six defensive outs. There are no exceptions for this, even if the game is shortened. If it's shortened because of a 10 or 15 run rule, if it's shortened because of a time uh, limit, if it's shortened because of rain or darkness, each player is guaranteed that. What is the penalty if a player doesn't meet mandatory play for a game? That player will start the next game will meet the mandatory play that they didn't meet in the previous game. So for example, perhaps a player batted once, had three defensive outs, and they still need three defensive outs. So they'll start the next game, get three defensive outs, remain in the game, and then meet the mandatory play of that game they're playing in then. And only at that point can they be removed from the game. There can be pen penalties on managers in certain situations. This isn't a game that's called for darkness or anything like that. This is a manager who's consciously and purposely not allowing all of his players to meet mandatory play because that manager is attempting to just win games. Uh, this is an interleague rule that if a team has 15 to 20 players who are rostered and at least 15 players show up for the game, mandatory play is re reduced to three defensive outs and one at bat. So now we come to the new 2022 rule for mandatory play, and it has to do with that phrase, bat at least one time. So what mandatory play for the bat at least one time is a player assumes the position of the batter with no count and one of the following occurs, retired as a batter, retired as a batter runner, reaches base and scores, or after reaching base, the inning or game ends. What Little League is saying is uh, the Little League experience is about playing in the field defense. It's about being able to bat, but it's also about being able to run the bases if a player gets on base. So the first time a player enters that box offensively, if they get on base, they cannot be removed for a courtesy runner, 
for a special pinch rudder runner or they can't be substituted for if they get on base that first time they need to also run the bases so <clears throat> excuse me um and this is what uh this is sort of refining it a little bit more when appearing offensively for the first time in the game the player must remain in the game until the at bat requirement of mandatory play is met so once that batter steps into the batter's box they must remain in the game until they meet that at-bat requirement. Also, if they are appearing for the first time and are batting and the third out is made defensively on uh, the uh, field, uh, they are required to come back up the next inning. So they, again, they can't be removed. So that's one of the really only two new rules that we have for 2022. Okay, I want to go through some regulations, and this is decorum and what we consider these uh, as we consider these as points of emphasis. So prior to and during the game, only managers, coaches, players, umpires are allowed on the field. There can't be parents that are out there. There can be only three adult coaches per team, even during the warmups. So for you umpires, when you show up to the game site, if you see a team that has four adults who are warming up the team, are coaching, uh, go to the manager and ask the manager to remove one of those uh, adults. No coach or adult may warm up a pitcher. It's fine to play catch with the players, but once you get into a squat position, sit down on a bucket, for example, and start taking pitches, uh, that is not allowed. Why is this rule in place? It's a kid's game. Let the kids play the game. During the game, no bat boys, bat girls, players. If they're not out on the field in the bullpen, they need to remain in the dugout, can't be wandering around. Uh, you need an adult coach or manager in the dugout at all times. Again, to umpires, if you see at any point that a dugout does not have an adult coach, call time, stop the game, and there needs to be an adult put in that dugout. And no one else allowed in the dugout. Again, no boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, brothers, sisters, parents. Okay. Intermediate, junior, and senior. The on-deck batter position is the on-deck circle closest to the dugout. You cannot cross over to the other on-deck circle. You must stay on your side where your bench is. We have the interleague rule that a game may begin and continue with eight players on either team. When you get to that ninth spot in the body batting order, it's simply skipped over. It is not registered as an out. There is no handling of bats in the dugout. This is a safety issue. Bats should be at one end of the dugout. When a player is going to go out uh, to bat, that's when they pick up the bat. That's when they leave the dugout with that bat. So why do we care about this? Why do we highlight this? Uh, for this reason. So consider this, these are adults which, with a much better sense of their surrounding than youth. And also, this is a major league dugout, which is very large, larger than anything our kids will play in. And even in that large dugout with adults, uh, swinging a bat can still lead to injury. So no bats in the dugout, no handling of bats. There is no jewelry that is allowed. We do allow medical alert bracelets and necklaces. We encourage that. Uh, but there's no rope necklaces, there's no kind of bracelets, rubber, or any other kind. There are no piercings of uh, earrings, of nose rings. If a player has a pierced ear, for example, you cannot tape over that piercing. 
So if a player has a piercing, uh, like an earring, the choice is simply this. Uh, that player removes the earring and plays the game, or they do not remove the earring and they do not play the game that day. As umpires, we should all be checking equipment. And hopefully all the umpires that umpire at the teenage baseball level will do this. So for helmets, we're looking for any kind of cracks. We're looking to make sure the padding is all there, that part of it isn't ripped out. If it is, we will remove that helmet. We make sure that it has the Noxe standard insignia. And if it has a, a cage in the front, we're going to make sure that it has all the screws and the screws are tight. We see a lot more batting helmets these days, batting helmet flaps, C flaps, whatever you want to call them. What are the general rules about these? The general rules are that you cannot drill new holes in a helmet to accommodate a C flap. Also, the manufacturer of the flap must match the manufacturer of the helmet. So you can see on the right hand side, we have a Rawlings helmet and a Rawlings uh, flap, and that's perfectly fine. On the left hand side, you can see that this helmet has what's been added to it is a generic C flap that doesn't match the manufacturer. That helmet will get tossed. What else about helmets? No shiny helmets, uh, no painted helmets, stickers. The general rule uh, is that no more than 20% of the helmet can have stickers. What's 20% of a helmet? I was a history and sociology major. I wasn't a math or an engineering major. Uh, I'm not going to be able to tell, but I can tell you that when you get stickers that big like the bottom, or that many stickers on the top one, uh, don't be surprised if the helmet gets uh, removed from the game. This is always a question of when does a catcher have to wear their full gear? When do they wear partial gear? Uh, there's really three different uh, stages to this. So if a catcher is doing infield and outfield practice and they are near a bat, they must wear the catcher's helmet with a dangling throat guard. If a catcher is warming up a pitcher, whether it's between innings, whether it's in the bullpen, you need a catcher's helmet with a dangling throat guard, athletic supporter and cup, and you also need a catcher's mitt. And then during the actual game, that's when you need everything. You need the helmet, the dangling throat guard, you need the protective cup, you need the catcher's mitt, and also you need the chest protector, long or short, and you need the shin guards. For the catcher's helmet, these are the two standard kind of helmets that we see, uh, but they, most, they both must have that dangling throat guard. And even if they have the long hockey style uh, catcher's mask, they must have that dangling throat guard. We also look for a space. Generally, uh, we go by two, uh, the width of two fingers uh, for to be below the helmet so that it can dangle. For the catcher's helmet, just like the other helmets, we're looking for cracks. We're looking for uh, the Noxe standard. We're looking to make sure all the screws are uh, in place. We're looking to make sure the padding uh, is appropriate. No skull caps are allowed in Little League Baseball at any point. In all divisions of baseball, we have a definition of a defective bat. A defective bat is a bat that's damaged, cracked, bent, dented, has sharp edges. A defective bat is not an illegal bat. If somebody comes into the batter's box with a defective bat, we're simply going to remove the bat from the game. And this is another reason why we want to have inspections prior to the game to go through for bats, to look for things like dents. Um, actually, the bat on the right 
I just took that picture Sunday. We were doing a umpire's clinic at Pinole Hercules and this bat was laying around at the field and you could see a massive crack throughout it. So why are we really concerned about damaged bats? Well, watch the umpire and watch around the umpire's head. I'm gonna see this a couple times. So you have a sharp piece of shrapnel that was heading straight back to that umpire's head. Uh, we may not be able to catch that on inspection, but if we can, we want to, and we want to get that bat removed. Okay, we talked about a damaged bat. We also have illegal bats. And what makes a bat illegal is that it's been altered. For example, it's been shaved out on the inside that it doesn't meet the proper length or diameter requirements, and I'll go through all of these in a moment uh, for each level, that it doesn't have the proper USA BAT or BB Core standard logo, logo, that the USA BAT or BB Core logo is unreadable. All BPF marked BATs are illegal in Little League Baseball. And a bat with pine tar, whether this is intermediate, junior, or seniors, if a bat has pine tar or an adhesive substance, that makes it an illegal bat. So what happens if a batter steps into the batter's box with an illegal bat? Well, if the penalty is discovered before the next batter enters the batter's box, and this is what we call the window of appeal, and it's discovered the batter is out. If a play occurred at that at bat, the defensive manager may decline or accept the penalty or the play before the next batter enters the batter's box. So if that batter with an illegal bat hit a home run, you know that manager is going to want the penalty, the batter's out. If, however, that batter hit into a double play, then that manager is going to want to accept uh, the play. But irrespective of either of those cases, what will happen in each and every case is that the first time we have an illegal bat, we lose the adult, a one adult base coach position. The coach still remains in the game, but they're going to have to stay in the dugout and you're going to have to get a kid with a helmet out on the bases. If there's a second violation, then we have the manager ejected. And any subsequent violation, the new manager is ejected. And remember, probably what's most important about this rule is always remove the illegal bat from the game. Okay, so what are the bat specifications? Well, intermediate and juniors are the same. If you have a non-wood bat, it has to have either a USA bat or BB Core logo. Again, all BPF uh, logo bats are illegal. If you have a wood bat, that's perfectly fine. You don't need any uh, logo on it. Uh, two and five H barrel diameter maximum, and it can be up to 34 inches long. So this would be intermediate and junior bats. They're either going to have that USA bat or the BB Core logo. They will not have that BPF. Seniors. Seniors, if you have a non-wood bat, must have the BB Core logo. In the senior level, BPF and USA bat uh, logos are illegal. You can have a wood bat, doesn't need any kind of logo on it. Two and five eighths barrel diameter maximum. Once again, now you can go up to 36 inches. Seniors also have another requirement, which is the drop three requirement, which is you take the bat's length and you subtract the ounces from that. And if it's uh, three or less, you're fine. 
but if it's over three, then that bat is illegal. So the example here, if you have a 33 inch bat, that's 29 ounces, subtract the 29 from the 33, you have four, uh, that's more than three, that will be an illegal bat. So again, for seniors, only that BB core is allowed. If you have a non-wood bat, you need a grip, some kind of cork or tape, composite material that extends a minimum of 10 inches from the small end of the bat. It cannot be slippery tape. In other words, you can't wrap it with electrical tape. We do not allow traditional batting donuts in Little League. And the thinking here is that it can actually damage a bat. You can, however, have a batting sleeve. Okay, lineup cards. So at the beginning of the game, each manager is going to have a lineup card that's filled out. And it's gonna, there's going to be the original, and then there's going to be three copies. We urge you to keep all of these copies together. Don't rip off one and give it to your scorekeeper. Keep them together. What can happen is that you rip one off, and then you realize you have to make a change, and then you change one of them and not the other copies. So keep those together. When you meet with the umpire in, uh, before the game at the plate, the plate meeting, you will then exchange these and give these to the umpire. The umpire will then take a copy, give a copy to the scorekeeper, give a copy to the opposing manager, and uh, the one manager will get their copy back, usually the bottom one, which isn't filled out. Uh, as well. Lineup cards, fill them out completely, please. Put the team, put the date, Homer away. Put your full name down. As an umpire, I want to know who you are. I'm not, I don't want to say, hey, coach, hey, manager. I want to be able to call you by your name throughout that game. Each player, minimum, first initial, full last name, jersey number, and their position if they are a starter. And for starters, use the numbering system. Put six, don't put SS for shortstop. Do not include the names of players who were not at the field when those lineup cards are exchanged. If you believe a player is gonna come in late, just tell the umpire. And when that player does arrive, then alert the umpire and the umpire will alert the scorekeeper and also the opposing manager. And remember, when those lineup cards are handed to the umpire, that's when a player is considered late if they show up after that. It is the manager's discretion whether that manager wants to play that player who came late. My recommendation, play the kid, probably not his or her fault that they came to the game late. Okay, substitution rules. So in intermediates, juniors and seniors, we are not using a continuous batting order. We are batting nine. In other words, there are nine starters in the batting order and you have players who are on the bench. So if you have a starter who has been removed from the game for a substitute, that starter may re-enter the game, but only in the same spot in the batting order. In other words, if they were the number four hitter, they go to the bench, they have to come back to that number four spot. They can't go into another spot. Now, if they were playing first base, when they re-enter the game, they can go to any uh, position on the field they want. It's just that batting order spot has to be the same but they can only re-enter the game when their substitute has met mandatory play. And in this case, mandatory play is bat once and six consecutive defensive outs. So what we say is the starter and the substitute are married together in that spot in the batting order. Once mandatory play has been met by the starter and the sub, 
Each of them may enter or re-enter the game as desired. You can have one play defense, one bat, one run the bases, whatever you want. A starter can be pulled prior to meeting mandatory play. In other words, in the top of the first inning, you can have your starter um, uh, bat. And then in the bottom of the first inning, you can substitute for that starter. But at some point during that game, that starter is now going to need to get those six defensive outs. So what all this means is a starter and a sub, because they're married together, they cannot be in the game at the same time. There is only one exception to this. It's rule 303, note three. And this is the case where a player can't continue in the game. All substitutes have been used up and we give the right to the opposing manager to choose from the players on the bench who is to go into that game for that player who cannot continue in the game. Okay, time limits. So for interleague, and make sure that you check with your league if you're playing uh, games in-house, these might be different rules. But for interleague, there are no time limits for any games during the week. So no time limits for weekday games. There is the exception that we can have time limits for weekend games, but only if it's that field has a series of games that have to be played and that league has made that decision to do it. The time limit, if you use a time limit, is one hour and 45 minutes. That's not a drop dead. It means that after one hour and 45 minutes, if you're in the middle of an inning, you continue that inning until it's over, but you will not start a new inning after one hour and 45 minutes. What if a game ends up tied? It needs to be rescheduled. So a regulation game for intermediates and above, at least five innings must be completed if it's going to be cur curtailed for darkness or time limits. And every effort must be made by the leagues involved to reschedule games canceled uh, by weather. And that's something that you'll be working with uh, Grayson with, I imagine. Okay, we're using the 10 and we're using the 15 run rule for intermediates and above interleague. And if you notice that when the slide becomes purple, uh, the purple slides all have to do with interleague rules. So after four innings or three and a half if the home team is leading and there's a 15 run lead, the game will end. After five innings, four and a half if the home team is leading uh, and a 10 run lead, the game will end. Uh, the losing team who is behind will concede. You will not then continue to play the game. Uh, if you want to, you know, continue, it becomes a scrimmage and the umpires will leave the field. Okay, protests. We don't really like protests. Listen, you know, interleague, this is recreational level. No district standings are going to be kept. Maybe you, your own league will. Uh, but we prefer not to have protests, but protests are allowed. So if you want to protest, remember, it can't be over a judgment call by the umpire. It can only be by a rules interpretation. The umpire, for example, is misinterpreting a rule or it's for an ineligible player. So if you file a protest, it must be emailed to Grayson within 24 hours of the game. And it must be clearly uh, delineated what the issue is. As the ADA, his decision is final. Remember, though, during the game, if you have a protest of a rules interpretation, that must be protested before the next pitch play or attempted play. 
Okay, Don, do we have any questions? Jim, we do. Well, let's, uh, let's go back here. Mandatory play definition. We have a player who's in the batting order who in their first at bat, they strike out. Their next time at bat, they walk. Can the runner be removed at that point? Yes, the runner can be removed because that first at bat was a strikeout, which meets that requirement of mandatory play one at bat. Uh, you're either put out as a batter, put out as a runner, score, or the inning or game ends. Okay, so we have another question that's come up that the um, person who asked the question wants to make sure that we have some shared understanding of this. So Jim, it might be you or perhaps Grayson needs to address this. So what is the... What are the rules or guidance, if any, on masks? And by mask, we need face masks as related to our COVID uh, safety plans that we've had. Last year, the rule was masks had to be worn at all times unless they were out on the field on defense. Coaches had to be masked at all time. What are the mask rules for this season? I am going to defer to Grayson on this one. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't. We had a conversation with Ted about mass, or no? We had we had. Sorry, we had a conversation about where the umpire is supposed to be positioned. Right. And we that had, was supposed to be behind, behind home plate. Was right so so know that for this year um in district four all restrictions on umpires for covid have been lifted so for mass i, I believe i don't think we're going to have a rule on mass i think it's going to be optional but i am going to talk with ted just to, to verify in terms of, of what that's going to be um, just to make sure that I'm not speaking out of turn. So you got to defer to a defer, and I'm going to defer it again. <laughs> okay, those are the questions, Jim. Okay, thank you, Don. Okay, and again, since it's in purple, that means that this is going to be an interleague rule. And again, uh, if you're playing in your own leagues, your own league may have a different stance on this, but when you play interleague, this will be the rule. We will be enforcing the one foot in the batter's box rule, which means that after a batter enters the batter's box, that batter must remain in the box with at least one foot throughout the at-bat. Now, when can they leave the batter's box? And this is what causes a lot of confusion. Anytime that batter swings the bat, uh, they can leave the batter's box. Anytime they're forced out by, say, an inside pitch, anytime they attempt a drag bunt, anytime the catcher does not catch the ball. Now, if the ball bounces and the catcher fields it, that's not catching the ball. The ball must be caught in flight. So if the catcher doesn't catch the ball, a batter can step out. If a play has been attempted, in other words, a steal of second base uh, and the catcher throws down, anytime time has been called, anytime the pitcher leaves the dirt mound area, we have some pitchers sometimes who will uh, leave the mound and walk halfway to home plate to receive the ball back. Anytime they do that, a batter can step out. Ball three count, the batter thinks it's ball four, uh, and then the umpire goes strike, and they're already heading down the first. They're allowed to leave the batter's box then. But if they don't meet those, if it's not one of those, then they must remain in the box. So what happens if you step out of the box? The first time it happens during an at-bat, 
the umpire will warn the batter. Now listen, if a batter steps out the first time they're at bat, and then the next time they come up to bat, they step out again, we warn them again. So this is only for an at bat. The umpire, the first time it happens, we warn the batter. The next time it happens during the same at bat, the umpire shall call a strike on the batter each time, which means that it's very possible for a batter to strike out on only two pitches. So the ball is live when we call that strike and no pitch needs to be made. Um, I think if somebody could mute their themselves, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Don, if you could mute somebody. Um, if a strike is called for stepping out, no pitch is added to the pitch count. We're not going to penalize the defense for something that the offense does. Now, listen, it's really hard to remember, you know, all those conditions of when a batter can step out. It's much easier to remember when a batter has to stay in the box. And this is how I go about doing it. If a pitch is a cold strike or it's a ball and it doesn't force the batter out of the box, if the catcher catches the ball, pitcher stays on the mound, no further play is made, batter must remain in the box. So it's just sort of an easy uh, checklist. Called ball and strike, catcher caught the ball, pitcher still at the mound, no further play, batter needs to stay in the box. Special pinch runner. We will be using the special pinch runner in intermediate and above because we are batting nine. And we will be using it so that it can be used once per inning per team, once per game per player, which means that each inning you can use a special pinch runner. But if you've used a special pinch runner for one player, you cannot use a special pinch runner for them again in that game. A special pinch runner is somebody who's on the bench who is not currently in the batting order, it is not considered a substitution for substitution rules. So for example, if your pitcher got on base and you want a special pinch runner for that pitcher, that pitcher isn't considered to have been removed from the game. Now remember, with special pinch runner, if this is the first time a batter has been up to bat, and the first time they get on base, the and and they get on base, you cannot use a special pinch runner. They must meet their mandatory play of one at bat. We will also be using the courtesy runner in interleague. It's only used for the pitcher or catcher of record when two are out. What does it mean of record? It means whoever was the catcher or pitcher that previous inning, those are the only ones that we can use a special pinch runner for. So what you cannot do is a player gets on base and then uh, as a manager come out and say, oh, I want a special pinch runner be for uh, number 15 because actually next inning, he's going to be my catcher. No, he had to have been a catcher that previous uh, half inning. So it cannot be a player who is currently in the batting order. And the same courtesy runner may not run for both the pitcher and the catcher at any time during the game. So if you have somebody who runs for a pitcher a couple of times, great. But that player cannot also run for a catcher. Stealing of signs. The rule and the associated penalties will be enforced during inter interleague play. So if a player is, or coach or manager, is stealing signs and alerting a batter of a pitch selection or location, it's unsportsmanlike conduct. The first time we see it, we will give a warning. Second time we see it, we will eject from the game. Where you most commonly see this is a runner at second base 
uh, who's looking in and looking where the catcher is lining and then moving their arm, their left arm or their right arm to try to say that it's going to be an inside pitch or an outside pitch. Okay, let's talk about some pitching rules. So this is another area where we have uh, 2022 rules have been uh, changed. So we have had before what's called the exemption. And that is when a pitcher reaches a limit imposed by their age or also um, rest or the number of pitches before they can go become a catcher. And I'll go through all of those. Uh, it was held that once they hit that limit, they can go over that limit if they're pitching to a batter and they continue to pitch to that batter. So they can continue to pitch to that batter until that batter reaches base, that batter is put out, or the third out is made to complete the half inning or the game. In red is what was added this year. The pitcher is removed from the mound prior to the batter completing his or her at bat. The way it used to be, a player, say, reached 85 pitches. That's, and for a 13-year-old, that's all they can pitch in a game. But if you're pitching in the middle of pitching to a batter, you could continue to pitch to that batter until they reached base, put out, or the third out was made. But the implication was you could not start keep pitching to that batter and then be removed from the mound when that batter was still up at bat. You had to complete pitching to that batter. Now the rule is you can be removed prior to that batter completing their at bat. This is also a change in the rules, but really what it is is sort of um, making the wording more clear. And it's saying for a pitcher's pitch count for the purposes of threshold, it's determined by the first pitch to a batter. In other words, if your first pitch to that batter is 85, then you can continue pitching. But if that first pitch to that batter was 86, you cannot do that. So it's, it's just a wording issue. Uh, the wording was a little bit vague prior. There were different interpretations. Okay, pitching limits. All of this is in Regulation 6, very clearly spelled out. So I'm not going to spend much time on these. Um, pitching limits, how many pitches you can pitch in a day, it's determined by age, by league age. So 11 and 12 year olds, 85, 13 to 16, 95. Threshold exemption allowed. In other words, if you hit 85 while pitching to the batter, you can continue pitching to that batter, but it will still be considered when you're removed to be 85 pitches. Rest requirements. Again, Little League is concerned about pitchers' arms. So we limit, uh, we, we basically say, if you're gonna pitch so many pitches, we're gonna require you to have some rest if it's uh, a lot of pitches. So for pitchers age 14 and under, for example, if you pitch 20 or fewer pitchers, uh, pitches, no days of rest required. A calendar day of rest means that if you pitch on, uh, say you pitched 30 pitches, on Monday, you have to take Tuesday off, and then on Wednesday, then you can pitch again. Again, threshold exemption is allowed for this. Juniors and seniors, 15 and 16 year olds, calendar days of rest changes. Now they allow a little bit, a few more pitches uh, before you have to take your day of rest. So who's responsible, who's responsible for this? Really anybody at the game, umpires should keep track of this, scorekeepers absolutely, but ultimately the responsibility rests with the manager. We have pitching logs in interleague and you need to bring those at each and every game and you need to have those pitching logs filled out. You can download them off the District 4 website. 
So uh, what that pitching log is going to tell you is players and when they pitched, how many innings they pitched. Again, District 4 website under baseball. This is what it looks like. And again, keep this with you at all time. Keep this in your equipment bag. Keep it up to date. So what happens if you show up to a game and you can't produce your pitching log uh, before the start of the game? Each of your team's pitchers will only be allowed to pitch 20 pitches in that game. And in this case, there is no threshold. 20 means 20. Your starter will pitch 20 pitches. Then you have a sub come in, pitch 20 pitches. Then you have another sub come in, pitch 20 pitches. So please bring your pitching logs to the game. Okay, if the manager of a team cannot produce the pitching log before the start of the game, the opposing manager may file a protest and we've talked about how to do that protest. You do it with Grayson and you do it within 24 hours. Um, but under all circumstances, the games shall be played. So if you're a manager and you believe that there is a pitcher who should not be pitching for the opposing team and that team can't produce their pitching log, you believe that they're ineligible to even pitch, you can file a protest, but the game is going to be played. Okay, so pitching and catching. So intermediates and above, if you catch four or more innings in a day, you cannot pitch that calendar day. Or, I'm sorry, catch four more uh, innings in a game, you cannot ca uh, pitch that calendar day. Catching a single pitch, not warm-ups, but in the actual game, catching a single pitch constitutes an inning. If you pitch 41 or more pitches in a game, you cannot catch the remainder of that day. And in this case, the threshold exemption is allowed. I want to point your attention to those key terms, calendar day, remainder of the day. Why this matters is if you're playing a double header and your catcher caught four innings in the first game, they cannot pitch that second game. If your pitcher pitched 41 pitches in the first game, that pitcher cannot catch that second game. So be very conscious of this. We also have a rule that if a player plays the position of catcher for three or fewer innings, moves to the pitcher position, and then delivers 21 pitches or 31 pitches for a 15 and 16 year old, um, in that same day, they may not return to the catcher position on that calendar day. Again, threshold allowed. What is this all about? It's basically saying that both the pitcher and the catcher are using their arms more than any other position player. And so we're going to be careful about the number of pitches and also the number of throws that that catcher makes if they're also pitching. All levels of Little League, no pitcher may pitch three consecutive days. You pitch five uh, pitches on Monday, you pitch five pitches on Tuesday. Doesn't matter that you're below uh, the 20 pitches. If you're a 13-year-old, you cannot pitch on Wednesday. And no intentional walks are allowed in intermediates and above. So for those of you who are coming from maybe the majors division where you could uh, have an intentional walk, not allowed for intermediate and above. Okay, intermediate, a player may not pitch in more than one game in a day. Juniors and seniors, you can do it. 
um, if you're league age 13 or above. If a player delivers 31 or more pitches in the first game, the player may not pitch in that second game. Threshold exemption is allowed. And if a pitcher pitches in two games in a day, the combined maximum number of pitches allowed is 95. So hopefully what you're noticing from all this, if you're going to play a double header, you've got to keep track of a lot of things with pitchers and catchers so you do not violate these rules. Pitcher removed from the mound remaining in the game may come back to pitch once in the game. Now, a player who has met mandatory play requirements and is a pitcher at the time may be removed for a substitute batter and re-enter the game as the pitcher once, provided the pitcher was not physically removed from the mound. What does this one have to deal with? This is if you have a starter who is playing a position and then comes out of the game, the substitute uh, who comes in for that player meets mandatory play. Now, remember what we said, those players can come in and out for each other. Well, um, you can once have that sub come in and bat for that pitcher. And it isn't considered being removed from the mound. Okay, visits to the pitcher, one per inning, two per game. Any visit to a defensive player is counted. So if you call your catcher over to the fence to talk to them, uh, the umpire will consider that a visit to the pitcher. If you go out and talk to only your first baseman, that is considered a visit to the pitcher. If you have an injury conference, you're worried about your pitcher's arm, come to the umpire first, tell them what you want to do, the umpire will then go and listen in on any injury visit because if strategy begins to be talked about, then we're going to charge a visit. Okay, intermediate juniors and seniors. Um, if you're on the rubber, you cannot bring your hand in contact with your mouth or your lips. The penalty, ball on the batter, and the pitcher is going to be warned that if they continue to do this, they can be removed from the game. What if the pitcher uh, licks their fingers on the mound, but not on the rubber? That's okay if and only if they very distinctly wipe it off on, say, their shirt or their pants before they contact the ball. Illegal pitches, balks, will be enforced in intermediates and above in interleague. So there are two specific kinds of illegal pitches that are different from other legal pitches. One is if the pitch is delivered and the pivot foot is not in contact with the pitcher's plate. For example, the foot is behind or the foot is in front of the pitcher's plate not in contact. The other specific kind of illegal pitch is what we call a quick return pitch. And this is when the batter is not reasonably set in the batter's box. I'm gonna talk about more about that in just a moment. So what's the penalty? If there's a runner on base, it is a balk, and we will advance that runner or runners. It's a dead ball and the base runners will advance one base unless the runner reaches first, say it's an illegal pitch, but the ball was hit and all other runners advance safely. Uh, pitch will be credit, credited to the pitch count only if the ball is pitched. If you don't have a runner on base and you uh, have one of these two illegal pitches, it's simply a ball on the batter. So there's a myth in baseball that once the batter steps in the batter's box, the pitcher has the right to pitch. That's not the way it is. 
when a batter enters a batter's box, they have the right to become reasonably set. So this uh, video right here exemplifies a quick return pitch. Obviously, it's at a lower level. This is a majors game. But when that batter comes in the batter's box, they have a right to become set before that pitcher begins their pitch. So I want you to watch this. We'll see it twice. Okay. By the time that player is looking up, that ball is already at his head. Had that been coming at his face, he would have had no ability to get out of the way. See, the pitcher is already starting the pitch. The umpire should have called time, should have stopped that pitch from even happening. Okay, there are a lot of other illegal pitches, uh, not completing the pitch, maybe starting the pitch and stopping, bringing the hands together, separating, bringing the hands together, separating, not coming to set, moving a shoulder, dropping the ball, et cetera. With runners on base, it's a balk. It's a delayed bed, uh, dead ball and the base runners advance one base unless, again, runner reaches first and all runners advance safely. A pitch will be credited to the pitch count, but only if the ball is pitched. Without runners on base, it's nothing. It's simply a do-over. Okay, this is interleague. The home team shall provide two umpires for each game. If you use a youth umpire, the other umpire must be at least 18 years of age. How do you question a call? We're getting towards the end here, folks. Um, and we're right about at the time. Um, so I want to go through how do you as a manager uh, question a call that the umpire has made? Now, remember, judgment calls, safe, out, um, ball, strike, fair, foul, those can't be questioned. So how do you question a call? It must be done by the manager. It cannot be done by a coach. So your third base coach can't begin talking to the umpire, challenging a call. It has to be the manager. The manager needs to ask for time. Time will then be granted to the manager. Go to the umpire who made the call. If you have a youth and adult and the youth made the call, don't automatically go to the adult. Whoever made the call, go to that umpire. As an umpire, what we will try to do is meet you halfway. We're not going to make you walk all the way out to us. We're going to meet you halfway. Don't begin your conversation with us until we actually meet up. Don't be yelling at us. If you're yelling, I am going to simply send you back into the dugout. So in a conversational tone, what you should do is ask a question of the umpire. Um, I saw my second baseman tag that runner, but you call them safe. Did you see a tag? I saw the first baseman pull his foot. My runner should be safe. Wasn't that an infield fly? Weren't there, wasn't there one out? And wasn't that a fly ball? And the second baseman was camped under it and there's runners at first and second. Shouldn't that have been called an infield fly? So ask a question. And then the umpire and the manager can have a conversation about it. We will explain our call. You can ask us if we can get help. At times, we're going to say no because that was our call. We saw it clearly. We know we had the best angle. But sometimes we will go ask for help from our partner. 
if we do decide to go ask for help, we're going to ask you to go back to your dugout. And that's where we want you to stay. The two umpires will get together. They will talk it over. And then at the end, the umpire who made the original call will then either confirm their call or change their call. But what you need to do is accept that decision. If you believe that the umpire is misapplying a rule, then you have a right to come out and uh, file a protest if you wish. Okay, Don, do we have any questions? <clears throat> so Jim, we don't have any questions about what you covered in the second section. We do have a couple other questions. Sure. Um, first one is question about coaches in the dugout. This person says, I'm having trouble recruiting a coach. I'm the manager. I'm on my own, it looks like. What does that mean about my need to stay in the dugout? Does that mean I have to have players do the base coaching? Um, first of all, if you're going to manage and coach a team all by yourself, uh, total respect for you uh, for volunteering and hopefully your league will get more volunteers for you. Um, it means that, yes, unfortunately, you have to stay in the dugout and you will have to have two players, both with a helmet on, uh, coaching the bases. Know that base coaches are required and we should never even start a half inning unless both base coaches are out there. So, yes, you have to. What does that mean if you want to challenge a call or you want to change your pitcher? Um, in that circumstance, uh, I'm going to allow you to go out of the dugout, but me as an umpire, I'm going to be going up the line and meeting you at your uh, dugout as a courtesy. Okay. The other question was, hey, these are all really good slides. I want to share them with others on my team and in my league. Are you going to give us the slides? Um, we will in a certain way. Uh, within a few days, it's usually within two days, right, Don, that these get posted? Yes. Okay. Uh, within a couple of days, um, if you go to the District 4 website, and you click on the umpire tag uh, link. And then within that umpire page, I think it's umpire training resources. Correct. Correct. Um, go click on that. It will take you to a link to the recording of this presentation. It's actually going to take you to YouTube uh, and it's a District 4 Umpires YouTube page. And so you will be able to look at that. You'll be able to share the link uh, with other folks, either on your team, your parents. Uh, please feel free to share these. This is why we record them. We want this information out. Okay, so those are all the specific questions that we got, Jim. Okay, I just have uh, just, I think, one or two more slides. Uh, one is, listen, let's always remember kids first, okay? Little League Baseball, if you go to rule number one in the rules and regulations of Little League Baseball, it states that Little League Baseball in all divisions is a game. And I want to emphasize it's a game. It's a game for kids. Who assures that kids have a safe and a fun game? It's the adults, it's the managers, coaches, and umpires. And sometimes we see ourselves as antagonistic, but I think what we should do is always see ourselves as on the same team that we are providing something for these players. Little League is a youth leadership program that just happens to use baseball and softball as a vehicle to teach leadership skills uh, to our uh, youth. 
what we should remember is what we want to emphasize is the experience, not the outcome. Emphasize the experience, not the outcome. The experience that kids have fun, that kids have a safe game, not the outcome, win, lose, that kind of thing. The adults are the ones who set the examples. Okay. Um, and remember, this is your ADA for Teenage Baseball. Uh, his link is also up on uh, the District 4 website. Uh, Grayson or Don, do you have any final words? I am done. I did get a, a couple questions that came directly to me, I just noticed. Okay. Um, one was if they could repeat the uh, batting sleeve um, option in terms, instead of a donut. It sounds like we can use a batting sleeve. You just want some clarification on that? Yes, you can use a batting sleeve. You can't use the donut, uh, which is sort of the traditional um, uh, the traditional batting donut. But if it's a sleeve, perfectly legal. Okay. And then the other question was, um, sounds like a question on leading off. Sounds like in, in these divisions, there is lead offs for the runner. Um, I don't know if there's any rules associated to that or not. Uh, no rules. Uh, you can lead off in the majors and below. Uh, the player must remain in contact with the base until the pitch reaches the batter or is hit. At this division, uh, you can be off the base, but if you are off the base, you are in jeopardy of being put out. Jim. Mm -hmm. Don, any final Jim. comment? Yeah, Jim, thanks. I, I have one um, quick topic to share. So as the district umpire in chief, you know, my role is to help leagues implement quality umpire programs in support of what Jim described, you know, as the, um, the elements of the game. And, and it's important that our players um, have consistent umpiring from game to game. So not knowing who all is uh, of the 30 or so folks who are on this uh, call, if you're a league official, a manager, an umpire, I, I encourage you to, um, to keep that in mind and recognize that um, if the individuals that are going to umpire your game were not on this call or on any of the district rules clinics that we've held, they, they most likely do not have an understanding of little league rules as they apply to uh, teenage baseball divisions. This is really important if you're hiring um, umpires from an outside association who umpire uh, high school, travel ball, pony baseball, whatever. Generally, they can get the strikes and balls correct and the out and safe. But all the other things that Jim covered tonight, they're, they're gonna have little understanding of that. So. Um, to the extent we can help you and your team and your league uh, with those issues, please feel free to call upon me or, or talk to Grayson as the ADA for Teenage Baseball, because it's important that games are umpired consistently uh, for the fairness of, um, of our players' participation. So uh, the, other, the other issue for umpires, uh, you know, as Jim mentioned in one of the later slides, is we must have an adult on, on a game. The Little League rules, of course, say that if you do not have an adult 18 years or older as one of the umpires for a game, you must have a game coordinator who is an adult in responsible charge of that game, on in that game only. Well, those are not our interleague rules. Our interleague rules are you must have an adult umpire. So please discuss that with your league officials, your league board, your league umpire in chief, and make sure that that's happening at all of our, um, at least all of our interleague games. So that's all I got, Jim. Again, I want to thank folks for uh, spending a couple hours with us tonight. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, I think Grayson, Don and I will hang on here for a minute or two if anybody has anything they want to discuss with us. 
Otherwise, we are done. Thank you.